Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. It's another Ask Jason episode of This Week in Startups. And we got all of these amazing questions from our new Slack room, which you can join by going to thisweekinstartups.com slash, wait for it, Slack. You all know Slack. You're all using it at work as we're remote. Well, we started our own Slack instance. It now has 25,000 members. And we have all these great rooms, including the book club, including Ask Jason, including Small Wins. We have one for every city, state, and country. We have ones for every profession or job function like design and UX or developers. And they're becoming very robust and there's lots of great conversations going on and really no marketing. We just bounce anybody who uses the Slack for marketing. And we only keep the people having intelligent discourse about this podcast and growing startups and investing in startups. On today's show, I answer a dozen questions. And boy, they were great questions. How do you catch an angel investor's eye in email? This is a really great question. The top five books I would recommend to an aspiring founder. I gave more than five, I think, and why you should read those books. Uh, What investors are looking for in a virtual pitch versus a real world pitch. And if my deal flow, people want to know if my deal flow has gone up or down during the pandemic, it's uh, the answer might be something other than what you think. So stay tuned. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Notion. Looking to stay organized and in sync with your team? Try Notion. It brings all your notes, docs, projects, and more together in one place, all fully customizable. Get 50% off Notion's team plan when you sign up at notion.com slash twist. And NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. Schedule a free product tour and receive your free guide, Seven Actions Businesses Need to Take Now, at netsuite.com slash twist. Hi, Jason. My name is Kate Morgan. I'm CEO of Gemologista, and I'm with several other ventures in Africa and some other countries. My question to you is, when an investor comes to you with a pitch deck at a meeting, or you're asked to sit on something like a pitch session, what do you think the number one thing most investors overlook that you would like to see in that? Or what do investors overlook and what does the pitcher overlook? What does the person who is pitching the company overlook that would really help clinch the deal most of the time? Okay, this is a great question. Thanks for asking it. If you, if you look at one thing people consistently leave out, it's not the team, it's not the problem, and it's not the product. In fact, that's what most pitch decks focus on. They focus on here's our team, here's the problem we're solving, and here's our product. And then they get into the market. All of those things are pretty simple. You should be able to go through them very quickly. Hey, we're a team out of Google. We've created a new website that solves the problem of uploading videos. The market is everybody in the world who has uh, a camera with on their smartphone who wants to upload videos. We call the site YouTube, done. Right? It's a very simple pitch. Here's the problem, et cetera. What people leave out most of the time, and it's such an astute question, is customers. Who is the customer for this product? Who are your existing customers? And who do you consider the most important customers? How do you make money from them? Why do they use your product? How did they solve this problem before? People leave out their customers all the time. And typically, the reason a young company leaves them out is because they're embarrassed that they have so few customers or that the customers are pretty nascent or small. And then big companies, well, or larger startups, uh, they may just leave it out of the deck because they get kind of bogged down in maybe their projections or the team or these weird market analysis, you know, uh, statistics that really don't mean anything to anybody. For me, when I see... Let me tell you about three of our customers. Our first customer is uh, Harvard University. They're putting videos on YouTube in this example um, in order for people to take night classes and get them into their night programs. Our second customer I want to tell you about is um, a young executive named I Justine, and she's obsessed with Apple products, and she makes all of these uh, fan videos of every Apple product, and they get 100,000 views each. And let me tell you about our third case. It's a plumber. And this plumber out of Sacramento 
is putting how-to videos up on how to do plumbing for yourself. And he has built a huge following and his plumbing business has grown 5X. Now, just those three I made off the top of my head, an educational institution trying to get customers, uh, this weird influencer person who just is obsessed with, and that's actually a real person, I just need, uh, and then the plumber. It shows a range of people, a sophisticated uh, college institution, a blue collar plumber, just the range of people who might engage the platform. That's what you wanna do. And I like leading with customers. Hi, I'm Jason. I'd like to tell you about my company, Airbnb. We let Susan here, who has three cottages on her property. One is an Airstream, one's a cottage, and one of them is the actual main house. She calls them all cottages, and she rents them. One of them's $49 a night, the other one's $149, and the main house is $349. She will stay in whichever one the customers are not in. And she has taken her home. She was unemployed. She had been laid off by GE, where she was a senior salesperson. And now she is making as much money as she made at GE. And she loves to make everybody breakfast and make scones in the morning, her famous scones. And she has over 400 reviews uh, in just a year because she's had all different people staying there. You see the way I explain that, it's so illustrative, it's got so much detail that it pulls the investor in. And investors sometimes don't even ask for this. I see investors get involved in these like intellectual discussions about the product and the market and hypotheticals and product features, and they never ask about the customers. The customers are the true north. It's very hard to fake a customer. And when we do actually spot people faking customers, by the way, they say we have three customers, and I say, okay, tell me where you got each one. And the first one is where they used to work. The second one is their fraternity brother. And the third one's their cousin. And we're like, okay, so you have zero customers. Let's talk about customers four through 10. Okay, great question. Let's go on to the next one. Hey, Jason. My name is Daniel Craig. I'm the co-founder of a um, business called Coffee Cake Films. We make videos for businesses for either internal or external purposes. And my question is, when are you going to be releasing your second book? Um, I loved your first, first book, Angel. That's my dream to become an angel investor. And I'm super excited for your release of your second book. Thanks so much. Great question. Uh, I started working on three different book titles, uh, three different actual books. And I decided uh, just over the last couple of months, which one I'm going to do first. And it's going to start unlike the other one where Angel led to Angel University. This one is going to start as a course where you pay to come to the course, a very small amount. Uh, and then you get the book. So I'm gonna, instead of building a course on the book, I'm gonna do the course and build into the book so I can get that interaction with folks. So that's the big news is that the course will be announced on July 1st or so. And I'll be doing the first course in July and I'm gonna probably do it monthly for the rest of the year. And uh, then the book will come out next year. So I actually started working on the book cover and I'm really excited about it and thank you. And you know, in terms of being an angel investor, you can go join the syndicate.com if you're an accredited investor. And I've been working really hard with the Angel University course to um, train people and build a framework that maybe even the SEC can use to help non-accredited investors prove that they're smart enough to invest money in private companies. And we really want to become partners with the SEC. And actually, we're going to reach out to them proactively in the coming months. So I hope you become an angel investor as well. And I hope that everybody, including a high school kid or you know somebody who's an Uber driver uh, or a waiter or a dishwasher, would be able to go online at some point and say, you know what? I want to make a $10 bet. I want to make a $100 bet on this startup because I believe in it. Why shouldn't you be able to do that? You can put $100 on the Knicks and lose it. You should be able to put $100 on a startup and lose it. It's your goddamn money. So- uh, hopefully that'll change in the next year or so. Let's take another question. My name is Avery Nimes and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hieroflux. So we have a program that is able to tell you how well your blogs and social media posts will perform before you post them. And that's using their own uh, unique data. So we're currently targeting marketing and SEO agencies and are doing market research and how we can best serve them. What is your advice on performing market slash customer research? And what's the best way to approach them um, as a research group, but also as future clients? Okay, this is a great question with an embedded promotion in it, well played. I like the idea of analyzing content and how it's gonna do prior to publishing it because you have a chance to change it. And in fact, a lot of the at scale content companies like BuzzFeed um, and Huffington Post back in the day, I don't know if they still do this, The un my understanding of it was they would test 10 headlines on Facebook, see which one got the most likes, and then put another 
X number of thousands of dollars behind that headline to get the viral nature of the uh, story moving, which if you're thinking about journalism and telling the truth is kind of weird, right? Like they're going for what creates the most rage or emotional uh, resonance. And, you know, we've had this discussion before about late stage journalism, but what you're doing and uh, your question is, hey, how do you prove the value? It's very simple. People already have blog posts they've been doing for a long time. So if you were going to go to a company that had written blog posts before, you would just go to Uber's website or Robinhood's website. You take Robinhood's previous blog posts, you run them through your engine, and you say, by the way, we looked at the blog posts you've already done. These would have done better if you had changed the following things. And we went ahead and did a test on Facebook with the same blog post, but with three different headlines. And we put $100 against each. And you can see here, this one that we edited for you would have gotten four times the number of clicks and views and likes. And this one would have gotten seven times the number of replies. So if you're looking for engagement in terms of replies, you should have went with this headline. And if you were looking for likes and clicks, you should have went with this headline because those that might be two different things, right? One that asks a question might get replies and one that leaves you wondering like these three things are going to make you more money in 2021. That one would have got more clicks because you're kind of link baiting people. So long story short, Instead of telling people what you can do, which anybody's able to do and everybody does all day long, show them what you've already done because their work is already public. That's the way to do it. I've had people do this with me before where they take clips of the show and they make super cuts of it or they make a trailer and they show me their work. Whenever you can show somebody their work um, improved, that is a great way to get a meeting. And that doesn't guarantee you're going to get the sale. By God, does it incredible when you uh, get a pitch from somebody where they put in more work than just cutting and pasting. So what I would do is I would go after 10 customers instead of 1,000, but I would do you know, three, four hours of work for each of those 10 customers. And this is just something in general that young people or young startups don't do well. They go for mass as opposed to targeting. You want to really be a sniper. You want to set up that shot, right? You ever see the snipers? And, you know, they have one person who's a spotter and they're they're making these minor adjustments. They're checking the wind and they want to just, boom, snipe it. You want to be that, a sniper, rather than somebody just machine gunning and spraying and praying. Because to spray and pray, you, you might hit a target, but it's going to be sloppy. What you want to do is pick the high quality target. You want to take out the high quality target. Be a sniper, not a machine gunner. Okay, let's take another question. If you want to turn your next idea into a new website, then you could blog and publish content, sell products and services, promote your physical or online business, or just announce an event or a special project. Well, Squarespace is the answer, not just for me, but for you too. It provides beautiful and customizable templates that are so powerful that they do all the e-commerce work you want to do as well. And you can buy domains there from over 200 extensions. You'll get great analytics search engine optimization, and free and secure hosting, as well as their 24-7 award-winning customer support. It's all optimized for mobile as well, so you don't have that janky website where you're trying to pinch and zoom. Nope. All the templates on Squarespace are gorgeous, and they work no matter what device you're on. Here's a little demo of my associate, Presh. He's browsing the templates, and he creates a site, and he chooses a photography template because he wants to make a gorgeous superhumanwallpaper.com site to showcase superhuman inbox zero images and you can build it in just minutes and it looks gorgeous like you spent tens of thousands of dollars on your website with some fancy dancy agency consultant and designers but nobody needs to know you just did it with squarespace so simple so easy here's your call to action go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch i want you to use the offer code twist t-w-i-s-t t-w-i-s-t and you'll save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain Once again, go to squarespace.com and build a gorgeous website with all that great functionality and use that promo code twist to save 10% off your first purchase. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hi, Jason. My name is Dan Hepworth. I'm a rising junior from Duke, uh, from Long Island, New York. And I currently run two startups. One is called the Massapequa Tutor. It's a pure tutoring company centered on Long Island. And the other is called Student Side. It's a nationwide network helping high school students connect with college mentors to learn about the colleges they're applying to firsthand. And what I want to ask you is what traits you find in the most successful founders 
and what steps I can take to develop those traits. So currently, right now, I'm trying to learn as much as I can to become the best founder possible by listening to your podcast, obviously, reading books like Zero to One, and talking to as many experts as I can. But I want to know what what steps I can I can take tangibly to develop the traits that you have seen in the best founders. Thank you. All right, this is a fantastic question, and you know you're already off to the races by listening to the podcast and building products. There are talkers, there are walkers, there are people who talk about building startups and who want to be rich, who want to be famous, who want to be leaders, who, who want to be great at the craft of entrepreneurship. And then there are people who build stuff. And the people who build stuff learn every day. And the people who talk learn nothing every day. Customers are the ultimate feedback loop and learning how to build a product. Oh my Lord, that is incredible. Now, you've got two businesses going. So that's fine when you're in uh, college, amazing that you're doing that. But one of the things that great founders do is they get laser focused. So you'll probably need to take one of those businesses and turn it off and ice it, put it on ice, and then focus on one. Other skills you're going to need to learn, obviously building product, obviously selling, obviously hiring great people, marketing. These are blocking and tackling skills that are easily learned by doing and reading and watching YouTube videos. All the secrets are out there. When I went to college in the late 80s, none of these secrets were out there. You could buy a book here or there, but the books were usually five, 10 years old, and they were management books, or you could go to an MBA program at NYU or Penn or Harvard or Stanford, but I couldn't get into any of those. And today, you have podcasts, you have online tutorials, you have YouTube videos, you have blog posts that are, for every topic, there's a thousand blog posts on how to do it. So really, your job is to sort through this deluge of advice and find the best advice and then apply it. So you're doing everything right. You don't need to be too difficult on yourself. If you're of action, if you're doing something, then you're learning, you're making mistakes, and you're hitting the roadblocks. So ultimately, the greatest skill you can have is in acquiring new skills. So you have to be learn, you have to learn to learn. Let me just say that again. You need to learn to learn. So just like Tim Ferriss is this incredible learner and he applies it to self-help, you can do the same thing applying Tim Ferriss's techniques and others and just be motivated to learn a new skill every day. And when you see a roadblock, don't think to yourself, I'm not a salesperson or I've never done product design. Think to yourself and just say to yourself, how hard could it be? That's what I always did. I'm not, I, wasn't the, I wasn't the brightest kid in the class, obviously, but I was a hustler. And I always just said to myself, I, I met the product designer. I, I met the writer. I met the editor. I met the photographer. They don't seem that much smarter than me. Maybe they're smarter. Maybe they're more skilled, but I, I think I could learn that. And that fearlessness of not being afraid to learn a new skill is what got me where I am today. I was never afraid. One of the first magazine, Silicon Eye Reporter and Cyber Surfer, Brian and Alvi, I would take the pictures, we'd write the stories, we would sell the ads. We did everything. We didn't care. And the reason we did everything is we had no resources. But I've carried that forward now, you know, into my life, uh, in my third act as a 49-year-old. I just said to myself, how hard could it be to raise a venture fund? How hard could it be to build a syndicate? How hard could it be to build a podcast? Whatever it is. None of this stuff is, should be scary to you. And so learning to learn, being resilient, and getting up to 60, 70% of the knowledge and proficiency in a skill is enough. If you can make a 60, 70% logo, it doesn't have to be the best logo ever built. It could be 60, 70% of perfection. That's good enough. Then move on to the next skill. Okay, you're, you're not the best sales executive ever, but yeah, you're 60, 70%. You're better than 60% of them. Good enough. And just keep adding those skills. So then when you hire somebody, you know how to interact with them. You speak the lingo. You've done the job before. And you're you're more like peers. So you can have this empathy with them. You can have this dialogue with them. Hey, you're doing sales. What kind of collateral do you need? What's your funnel like? How are you keeping track of your leads? What's the CRM? If you can speak that language, you're going to be in great shape. And it's all online now. That's the great thing about the web. When I started as an entrepreneur, the World Wide Web did not exist. Let me say that again. When I started as an entrepreneur, we did not have the World Wide Web. That happened in 1993, 94 timeframe. And even at that time frame, it didn't support images. So it was just some text, sometimes flashing text, which is really annoying. That's an aside. So anyway, you're doing everything right. Great job. 
And I'll see you in the uh, This Week in Startup Slack. That's another great breakthrough is like just going into these communities and asking people for help and asking questions, right? So great job. And I really like your business ideas. All right, Shapar asks, what is an ideal subject line for a cold email to an angel investor? What kinds of emails catch your eyes? The best thing you can do to get an angel investor to reply is to show traction. So if this were, if your company was Fitbot or Calm.com, the meditation app, if you said, our meditation app just broke 300 paid subscribers, I'm opening it. And if the top was a chart of your weekly cumulative or your weekly subscribers or both, those two charts are pulling me in. Performance, traction, that trumps everything. Now, second to that, talking about me, the investor, and why I am the perfect investor for you is another way to do it. So if you said, hey, I'm starting an online yoga app and I know you're an investor in Fitbot and I know you're an investor in Calm and I know you're an investor in Steezy and meditation, cross fitness and dance deserve to, are very similar to yoga, which doesn't have a subscription business. We do a yoga pose a day and we do a yoga, uh, we, we perfect a yoga pose each day for 365 days a year. And then we do a class every night. So we do two videos every day, perfecting a pose and a class. And we now have 275 paid subscribers at $60 a year. Um, now you've personalized it to me because you're telling me that my signaling was so good on Calm, Steezy, and FitBod that I should recognize the opportunity. So that's two things. One, your traction. Two, my investor startup fit, investor product fit. So always lead with the traction, even if it's modest. Got our seventh client, got our 17th client. That will separate you from 90% of the emails we get. 90% of the emails an investor gets are from people with ideas and who are telling us their sob story, begging for money, uh, telling us their entire history, all their pivots. We don't care, we don't have the time. Just tell us what's the traction, why am I the perfect investor for you, and things will go a lot faster. And you're probably saying, well, what if I don't have traction? Then why are you emailing angel investors? Get back to work and get some goddamn traction and separate yourself from the 90% of talkers and be a walker. Okay, let's take another question. All right, Amy asks, top five books you would recommend to an aspiring founder and why? Fantastic question. All right, I'm gonna leave Angel out of it, which would teach you how investors think. I like Creativity Inc. Uh, by Ed Catmull. He was also on the podcast. That gives you a good idea. I like these inspirational ones. Um, Shoe Dog, another great inspirational one. I think that you need to read The Lean Startup. That's sort of blocking and tackling to learn those techniques. Also on my list, hmm, let me think about this now because those are the ones that I think are must reads um, because they'll inspire you. Good to Great's another good one. Yeah, I think Good to Great would be on that list. Really depends on if you need tactical advice or if you need advice on uh, or inspiration. So I like the inspiration stuff. Who else is another great inspiring... Yeah, I'll go with who is Mike Ovitz, or we recently read in the This Week in Startups book club uh, in the Slack, we recently did um, Bob Iger's The Ride of a Lifetime. I like these stories about the executives from the 80s and 90s before the internet, um, because you can really see how those media companies were built. I think, you know, Pixar, CAA, and Disney all fit into that, and those are what those three books are about. So I, I just take that triumvirate and then add it to Angel and Lean Startup. I think you're off to a good start. And you, you know, really, a lot of these books will show you that the focus and making products incrementally better and not giving up, and that these things take decades. That's one of the real reasons to read these books. If you look at Shoe Dog, you can see how Nike grew over decades and exactly how much resiliency. Uh, Phil Knight had to show if you look at the Bob Iger book, you can see him just iterating and iterating when he was at ABC Sports all the way through Disney and a ABC News and all the innovations they did. When you look at Ed Catmull from when he was building, you know, very rudimentary computer graphics in the 70s all the way up into building Toy Story and then eventually getting bought by Disney uh, Creative Artist Agency, you, you really get to see how Mike Ovitz built an entire um, he just revolutionized the entire industry of the agency and took over Hollywood. I mean, and, and packaged together things like Rain Man and Jurassic Park. These are all stories, what the, all these stories have in common is that they were decades long arcs and that people innovated and they were relentless in their pursuit of greatness. It just kept making products better and better and innovating. And, and really that's what startup culture is about, is not giving up, 
taking a decade, multi-decade view and iterating. Look at my career. I'm here. I am at the end of my third decade and it's, you know, it's working and it started working, be honest, in the first decade, but the third decade got pretty damn good. I'll tell you that. All right, let's take another question. We got a lot going on here at Launch My Investing Company. You know, we have the podcast and we do the Launch Accelerator. Over 100 companies have gone through that. We do all of our events like the Angel Summit and Launch Festival Sydney and scale just tons and tons of stuff to keep organized and our company has become addicted to a product you may have heard insiders talking about it's called notion n-o-t-i-o-n notion like i've got a notion that you've heard about this if you haven't it is an all-in-one tool that does so many different jobs in our organization you can organize all your notes documents projects and workflows in one spot in a way kind of like a to-do list or project management, or a wiki, or a Google Doc, but it's all in one place. And you never have to worry about where that information is. It's got all this ability to put different structures of data on one page. And when people send me the reports of what they did for the day, they'll just include a link to their Notion page. And it's almost like a little dashboard for me to see the top level of what they're working on. And here is our associate press showing us his to-do list tracking system that he built on Notion. You can see it's customized by how he likes to keep track of what he's working on. And as some of you know, I get my team to write what's called an EOD. Here, this to-do list is just an easy way of keeping track of things. He's templated it. So each week, Presh can just click a button and have the layout ready to go. And on top of that, Notion is so customizable that we're able to work exactly the way we want to. We can store meeting notes, trace deal flow, and even track our time spent throughout the day, all customized to our exact preferences. Here is your call to action. To get started, Notion is offering 50% off their team plan for your first year. This is real money. 50% off the first year by going to notion.com slash twist. Notion.com slash twist. Once you try it, you'll be surprised about how much it can do for you. Again, notion.com slash twist. I am just delighted that they are supporting the podcast because we're using the product all day long. And when they said they wanted to reach this audience, our audience, you, the founders out there building great companies, I was like, this is going to be the easiest ad read for me because I am addicted to using the product. Let me know what you see behind the slash key, right? Forward slash. You know what I'm talking about if you use Notion. Let me know what your favorite is. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, here's a timely question from Andrew. How has your deal flow been impacted since the virus outbreak? It's gone up. It's gone up massively because people know that I'm one of the investors who's still writing checks. We did seven companies into our accelerator, 100K check each for the launch accelerator, and I've met none of those in person and we're doing it virtually. I would say a third of VCs are definitely not making investments in 2020. A third are hyperactive and looking at this as an opportunity to invest more. I'm in that group where there's an op unique opportunity here to get into great companies and to support founders. And then there's people in the middle who I would say are taking a very measured approach. They want to see what happens. So they'll selectively make investments. But for sure, I'm seeing many more companies contact me. And I expect that many more companies that have traction are going to be uh, having flat rounds. So what that means is they may have raised money at, let's just call it a $10 million valuation two years ago. And they had no revenue at that time. They were just a hot startup, great idea, slick product. And here we are two years later, let's say, and they now have 2 million in revenue. Well, they might, their valuation might only, the, they might have a flat round at 10 million or they might, their valuation might go up to 12 million, only go up 20%, even though they added $2 million in revenue. So I look at that and what I see is the market was way overheated when they raised that $10 million round. It should have been $4 million, but they filled into it. And at $2 million, maybe they should have a $15 or $20 million valuation, but maybe it'll be on sale at $12 million. And so I think the, the savvy investors are going to look at this and say, this is a unique opportunity when one third of people have closed for business and one third are taking a measured approach for that one third who are not scared. I'm not scared. I'm going to get in there and write these goddamn checks and I'm going to get a piece of the action now while those other two thirds are wondering if they should, and they're curled up in a ball under their desks. When people are scared, uh, we're gonna be greedy. And that, I think that's Warren Buffett's quote. When other people are scared, you wanna be greedy. And so we're not greedy necessarily, but yum, yum, we would like to be in business with founders who are building great businesses. And if we can get in at the right price, as an investor, you need to get, it. what price you get in matters because your multiple will be based on how low you bought and how high you sold. And I made my investments in Uber, Thumbtack, Datastax, Robinhood, all these great companies when the market was very low. 
and I was able to liquidate some of those when the market was very high. And here we are, the market's very low again, and I'll just ride the cycle again. It's basically like getting to the beach when the tide's just coming in and it's low tide. You get to get all those great waves as opposed to showing up when the tide's peaked and about to go down. And market timing is everything. So we work through these up and down markets, but th that's basically what my life's been like. A lot more emails and uh, a lot more Zoom calls, which are exhausting. Like staring at a Zoom camera all day is brutal. I'm turning my camera off now. I just turn my camera off so I don't have to stare into it or if I'm looking down, I don't look like a maniac. But um, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm, I'm really shocked that I actually made those 700K checks without meeting the founders. I never thought I would do that, but you have to adapt or you die. Okay, Dharma has a blocking and tackling tactical question. How important are trademarks and what impact can a great name, domain name have on a company? Any hacks for this? For sure, 100%. When people see a great domain name like Robinhood.com or Com.com, this inspires people because it's hard to get those domain names. It's hard to have a one word domain name. And it makes you look like you have a serious brand, Inside.com. And a great brand should evoke something in people, Com.com, Inside.com. These one of them makes you feel calm because it's calm.com. And one of them means, hey, we're going to go inside this topic, inside.com slash transportation, inside.com slash AI, inside.com slash San Francisco. You, you inherently know what this research is going to be about. And inside.com is like a research company. So if you want to get inside of AI, you just go to inside.com slash AI. So I think it's great. Tra when you have the domain name, you kind of have the trademark. So whoever owns calm.com, they basically own calm, even if somebody else had it. Uh, or they have, you know, there, there's inside the NBA and inside baseball, right? These two things existed before I owned the inside.com trademark. So I can't use inside the NBA, right? I think TNT would be quite upset. Or I think inside baseball is actually a long running television show, if I'm not correct. So I can do inside.com slash baseball or inside.com slash NBA and then make it clear this is inside's newsletter about the NBA. But I would not use the branding inside the NBA. And I would not refer to it as such because I don't want to infringe on anybody else's trademark. But that shows you the power of a great domain name is that whoever gets the .com, they kind of get the best branding in the entire space. So it's really worth trying to get that .com eventually. You could start without it. You could have inside.net or insidenewsletters.com. That's fine. But if somebody were to create right now, you know, inside artificial intelligence, the podcast, I'm going to beat them with Inside AI. And when we do the Inside AI podcast, eventually we're going to just outrank them, right? So that's one of the things that gets baked into having a domain name. If somebody wanted to try to create, you know, a meditation app and say, you know, becalmer.com, it's like all that's going to do is half the people who hear becalmer.com are going to go to calm.com and they're going to assume calm.com is it. So if you start um, newsletters that take you inside a topic.com, all it's going to do is drive more traffic to me. So that's why you don't want to create a derivative name that's already known in the world, right? And trademark is a bit of a test. A trademark is just something you spend $1,000 on to officially, when you have somebody come at you and, and do something confusing in the market to say, here's my trademark. Here it is. I am calm.com, the meditation app. We have it in this vertical. And it's all verticalized. You generally don't have it across all categories unless you have a very unique, weird name like Yahoo or Google. Um, you can't app, even Apple, the mighty computer company can't own Apple records that came before it, or they can't own Apple dry cleaners. Or if you wanted to start a restaurant called Apple or a cafe called the Apple cafe, they can't stop you. Apple's a generic word. I can't stop you from starting something called inside because inside's in the dictionary. Of course not. But I can stop you with the inside trademark from doing a newsletter that would confuse the public because I have that trademark. You get the idea. So I wouldn't obsess over it, but I would really be thoughtful about it. And just as another aside, if you can't get the domain name yet and you're negotiating it, you can get something like get blank. So let's say you were calm.com and you didn't have the domain yet. You could say be calm.com, get calm.com. Now the app could be called calm. And the domain name to get you to the app store would be getcom.com or try. So we have a company called Lately that makes social media tools very slick. If you're a social media manager, go to trylately.com. So they put try in front of it, get. Any of those uh, words as a, as a prefix or sometimes a suffix, um, like project, you could do the com project. Com, uh, you know. Uh, obviously was lucky enough to get the domain name. And when you have the great domain name, it leads to investors having more confidence in you. One of the reasons I really was 
um, interested in investing in com was that Alex had gotten com.com, a four-letter domain name. It showed me he had some amazing ability to negotiate with that owner of the domain name and to get something as an asset that was super important in the world. Great question. Okay, Pedro asks, if startups are seeing customer acquisition slow down, do you have any recommendations to improve retention? This is a great question. I don't think that customer acquisition is slowing down for all startups. Right now in the middle of the pandemic, it's feast or famine. For some people who have public uh, real world businesses, yes, it's going to be hard for them to acquire customers. They're going to have to really retain the customers they have. But for some, people have time on their hands. Maybe they want to try a meditation app. Maybe they want to try trading stocks. Maybe they want to try um, you know, looking for homes on Zillow or something. So it really depends on the category. One of the things that's also happened, um, so the premise of your question I question, is customer acquisition cost has gone down. Less people are spending on advertising. All the people who have real world businesses are no longer spending on advertising. If you were SeatGeek or Ticketmaster trying to sell tickets, you don't have the ability to sell tickets because there's no real world events. So those people who bought a lot of ads on Instagram, Facebook, and Google, and YouTube, they're no longer in the market. Their marketing budget is now 0.0. .0. That means if you are steezy and you have a dance app or your com.com and have a meditation app or Fitbod uh, or tone base, you're trying to teach people classical guitar, you get to have that ad space at a lower price. So there is cheap ad space to be had in a down market, which means the strong companies will be spending money into the down market to get customers. Now, in terms of keeping people in retention, uh, I think lower prices, and longer duration for the subscriptions equals less churn. The more opportunities people have to churn, the more frequently they will. So I would never, ever sell monthly. I would always sell yearly and charge a much lower price for yearly so you only have one time a year that you're asking people to renew. Com.com, I think when they started, was 10 bucks to buy the app one time, then it was 10 bucks a month, and I think now they kind of settled at around $60 a year. And then you could buy a two year maybe for $99. So if those people buy a one or two year, that means they don't have to ask them again. And you don't have this cognitive dissonance or this tyranny of making a decision as a consumer every month. That's why when Disney Plus came out at $7.99 or $6.99, I think was their introductory price. They also had $69 a year or $59 a year as an introductory price. When I saw that, I was like, yes, yearly. And if they had offered a five year, I would have just bought it five years for 250. I know Disney Plus isn't going anywhere. Why they didn't do that, I have no idea. They should, they should literally offer a 10 year Disney subscription for 500 bucks. They would crush it. Somebody send this to Bob Iger. Bob Iger, you should offer a 10 year $600 subscription or $50, $500 subscription that comes with one free ticket to Disneyland, you would have so much cash come in, it would be ridiculous. And then you get to book that cash, oh, I'm sorry, get that cash flow in now and then book it over time. Man, it's a big win. So that's how you reduce churn is not being monthly, but lowering the price and letting people make a decision yearly. Because if they get even a modest amount of value from what you're offering, they're not going to unsubscribe. If you like The Mandalorian and it comes out once a year, and you pay 60 bucks a year, that's what it costs to take your family to a movie anyway, right? Five people going to mo a movie a year, that would used to be 15 bucks here, so it's like $100 basically to go to the movies and buy popcorn. $60 a year, I go see 10 episodes of The Mandalorian, easy peasy decision. So lower the price and extend the duration of the subscription and you'll see retention plummet. Great question. Well, everybody, the last few months have certainly taught us what's important in life. It's also taught us what we need to eliminate or even change. It's the same for business. What are the changes you need to make? Do you have a hairball of multiple software systems and you could streamline on just one? Well, all you need is NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. Finance, HR, inventory, e-commerce, everything you need. All in one place. You save time, you're certainly going to save money, and there'll be a lot less headaches, that's for sure. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in sales, NetSuite gives you visibility and control so you can manage every penny with precision. And that's super important now. Join over 20,000 companies who trust NetSuite to go faster with confidence. NetSuite surveyed hundreds of business leaders and assembled a playbook of the top strategies they're using as America reopens for business. Receive your free guide, The 7 Actions Businesses Need to Take Right Now, and schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com twist. Get your free guide and schedule your free product tour right now 
at netsuite.com slash twist. netsuite.com slash T-W-I-S-T. Thanks again to NetSuite for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. It means a lot to our community that you've been with us for so many years and supported us uh, so deeply. And I personally appreciate it. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, we got a question from Ivan, which is really uh, prescient. How are VCs sizing up founders without physically meeting them? What are your tips on evaluating, recognizing any it factors over Zoom? I cannot get a read on people over Zoom nor am I trying to get a read on them. There's no body language. We're not in the same room. We don't have that extra like half hour of, you know, getting to know each other before and after the meeting and making small talk. So when you're making decisions now, it's really going to be based on diligence. So I stopped trying to make this decision based on what I normally do, which is half diligence and half my read on the person. I've gone 100% to diligence. That's it. I'm not going to even try to read you. It's like playing online poker. Online poker, you don't have the ability to read somebody, so you just go with the data you have, which is how much did they bet, what position are they in, what do they do the last 10 hands. Here, I'm just looking at what's their customer base, what do their customers say about them, what's their revenue, how's their revenue growing, what's the quality of that revenue, what are the cohort data. That's what we've moved to, to be totally honest, and looking at the product. So I think if you are a founder trying to raise money right now, you really want to lean into having really clean data sets and a really uh, clean data room because you're not going to be able to rely on your presentation ability over the next year. You're going to have to rely on the, the actual data, the actual customer testimonials. So really dial those in. I would rather see you have 10 great customer testimonials and 10 great months of cohort data that you really parse and understand that you can speak about critically. And then don't worry about the presentation. Let the data be your guide as the founder. And then for investors, same thing. If you're a great reader of people, you're not going to have that ability. It's going to be muted. So really just look at the data. And so what that means is overall, the people who win in a down market are the people with performance. The people who lose are the people who are raising money based on charisma uh, or their ability to spin a yarn. That's over for now. And maybe it's over for a year, maybe it's over for three months. Nobody knows, but really get focused on your data room, get focused on your customer testimonials, get focused on your cohort analysis. If you don't know what any of those things are, Google them. Let's take another question. Okay, Jerry asks, better to offer a free version of a product with limited functionality or offer the full product free for a 30-day trial and then look to convert. Both of these can work. I've heard arguments on both sides. Here's the argument for giving people a time-based trial and letting them use all features. If you let them use all features, they know what all the features are and they get to experience it uh, fully and then they time out and then they pay. So the argument for limited functionality is, okay, they really want to try to use that feature and they're frustrated and then they pay. It really does vary by product. I think... You have to look at exactly what kind of product you have. If you look at Slack, the free version, most people who use Slack don't know that they have Zoom essentially built in because that's not in the free version or they don't know that groups exist or that some of these other really nuanced features exist like analytics. And so I really don't like the way Slack does it, which is they give you a version that doesn't work uh, and doesn't show you all the features and then you upgrade to unlock those features. I would much rather see Slack give you all the features and then say, you know, these features turn off at 60 days or 30 days. But I think what Slack's doing is a little bit of a hybrid. When we started the This Week and Started Up Slack, we didn't have the advanced features. Obviously, we're not paying for 25,000 people $6 a month. And, you know, there's a couple thousand who are active. So I think our bill would be probably 30,000 a month, a half a million dollars a year. It's a free Slack. Um, and so we're actually looking at Discord, which people say is better for large groups. I don't know if it is, but we're going to stick with Slack for now. We might try Discord later. But all of a sudden, we woke up one day and Slack had turned on the premium version for us. So we were able to see our analytics. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Seeing our analytics is not worth a half million dollars a year, obviously, even if we could charge the people in the Slack to pay for it. Like, it's interesting to look at the analytics, but it's it's not going to make us convert. But groups was a really interesting one. So you can make groups of users, right? We could have the New York users in one group, et cetera. So I could understand why a corporation would want those features. So that's a hybrid system. Both of these can work. It really is product dependent. You can test it. It also depends on if how expensive your product is too. So for something like Canva, 
you know, they may let you use most of the features for free. And then you hit a roadblock. I think when you hit um, the libraries of the templates, but you can still see the templates, you just can't use them. So that's a nice friction point because it's like, well, I see the template, but I can't save it or use it unless I pay $8. Well, $8 is nothing. So I think it really depends. W one of the problems with like a Slack or like a Salesforce is those products are so expensive that the if you discover a tiny feature that you like, it still may be too expensive for you to turn it on. So this is where it's really about looking at the data and really understanding your product and how many features it does have. And if you have a sales team or not. If you don't have a sales team, well, you know, you might be better off uh, doing the time-based one where they can see everything and then it turns off. If you do have a sales team, uh, maybe it's better that you don't let people even try the product without filling out a form, contacting a salesperson and having them turn it on so they can start the dialogue, right? That So there's actually a third piece that you missed out here, which is give us your information for us to set up a trial and a demo for you. I think that that's what high-end products do. And then the more lower price products, let's call it under $10 a month, will probably do one of these two other methods. And there's a new one that emerged actually on this podcast itself. We see uh, folks like Zendesk or Notion giving the product for free for the first year or half price for the first year for startups that don't have a Series A or have under 10 million or under 50 users. So there is this new concept, at least for SaaS, of let's not even try to make money off the small companies. Let's just get them addicted to it. And if they happen to grow past 25 or 50 employees, if they happen to raise $10 million or more, then we'll charge them because they can afford it. But for the companies that can't afford it, why not be a mensch and support them by giving them the product free or with a steep discount? I also think HubStop, HubSpot had a startup program as well when they were an advertiser on This Week in Startups last year. So the startup programs is a third, a fourth vector here and another spin you might want to try. Great question. All right, Naeem, I hope I didn't uh, butcher that, has a question. Having trouble seeing sticky user behavior. Should we push new products in search of product market fit or focus on improving existing products and finding the right market for them? This is a, a timeless question. A lot of people go on the feature death march where they just make a new feature every three months for 18 months, whatever their funding is, and they try six things, none of them stick, and they shut the company down. And then people are worth wondering, you know, the third thing we tried had the most life in it. If we hadn't even messed with ideas four, five, and six, and we had just triple down on number three, I think we would have got product market fit. And so what I always like to do is, is there a sign of life in this feature? Let's double it and see if the usage doubles. And so um, I'll give an example of that. We used to do this week in startups once a week, and then we did it twice a week. And we did better. And now we're doing it three times a week. Um, and, and this is like a classic challenge for people is this focus ability. And then I see founders who have what we call in the business founder ADD. It's not a little clinical like you have ADD or ADHD, but the founder can't stick to one thing long enough to go deep. And I would say more often than not, startups die because of founder ADD than founder focus and obsession over one thing. If you know that your customers are getting value from that one thing, keep making it better. And you need only look at Facebook and Uber uh, and Airbnb, these companies were relentless at focusing on the core product and not at second and third products for a long time. Facebook was really focused on making your wall and posting to your wall and building out your social graph the focus for years. They didn't add groups. They didn't add their marketplace, their Craigslist killer stories, buying Instagram, all of this other stuff, the portal. They didn't do all that stuff until years five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They were focused for those first five years just on getting everybody on the platform and building out that social graph, which led to this incredible foundation on which to build. So if the foundation is building and getting stronger and the footprint's getting bigger, why would you build up when you could build out? Build out that giant foundation and then build up. Another example is Airbnb. They just kept getting more inventory on the core product and then they added experiences. And people said, well, why don't you own and operate? Why don't you do get around and have cars? Nope. 
They just wanted to build out that foundation of getting you an instant booking for a room for 50 to $250 a night and just, just crushing those one, two, three, four star hotel, one, two, three star hotels, really. The four and five star hotels did fine. But those one, two, and three star hotels that were 50, 100 bucks, those were the ones that got demolished by Airbnb because they were so relentlessly focused. Also Uber, they didn't add Uber Eats until years five or six. They didn't add Uber Pool until year five or six. They were really focused on ride sharing and Lyft remains focused on ride sharing without ever adding a second product. Um, so focus almost always, if you have a product that's getting traction, is a better idea. Now, there is the, the question of, hey, we've been focusing on this one feature and it topped out at a thousand users and we can't get this, the next thousand. Well, then you have to, talk to those next thousand and say, why aren't you doing it? Is it an issue of price? Do they not need the product? And you just got to do a little product discovery there. And what that would mean is you're probably just going to shut down that first product and then start over with what you learned with, and pivot to something else. So there's pivoting and then there's just adding features that nobody needs. You want a feature that everybody's going to use frequently like Uber Eats uh, or meditation, anything that people are going to use over and over and over again and get massive value from, that's when you get a big win. Okay, great questions.